Okay, everyone, so uh, kind of cold and windy and rainy Thursday night. Um, hands up who's actually been to one of the Breath Hacks events before? Not that many. This first time we're running in Parramatta, so it's good that you guys all came along, so it gives us like a good judge of numbers. And if we, obviously, it's a pretty good turnout, so we might do one in Parra and one in City um, every month. So um, I'll just kick off quickly on the MC tonight. Um, I'll just tell you guys a little bit about what the group is. So um, if you haven't joined the Facebook group yet, join the Digital Marketing Australia Facebook group. Uh, we're a not for profit. Um, what we are is a free group for everyone who wants to get involved in marketing or businesses or growth in, in Sydney and Australia as well. So we, uh, we're in Melbourne and also Sydney. Um, what we do is we'll put all the presentations and the notes into the group. There's a lot of free content on there. Um, it's a great community. The job's on there as well if you want to get into marketing or you know, if you want to hire someone. I might actually hire them, by the way, guys. Sneak it in there. Uh, sneak it after. Uh, it's a really great group just to help each other along. So, um, really quick, one second overview of who I am. I'm going to be the MC this evening. My name is Will Wang. I run a results driven uh, digital marketing agency called Growth Labs. Um, and um, I'm the virtual CMO and startup advisor for a few of the startups in Sydney and the US as well. Um, but enough about me. I uh, wanted to give a special thanks to uh, Launchpad and Western Sydney Uni. Uh, obviously, this is their space, so it's really amazingly generous for them to give us the space, provide the beers and pizzas. Um, and I wanted to bring up Beck from Launchpad. Um, Beck is kind of like, I call her the superwoman of Australian startups. She's been around in the environment a little bit, um, and she helps a whole bunch of startups. So I'll get her up here and talk about Launchpad a little bit. Um, so as we mentioned, I'm the program manager at Launchpad, and um, is this, hands up if this is your first time at Launchpad. Cool. Um, yeah, so a little bit about Launchpad, we're a technology business incubator that's um, run through the university, so we do a lot of work around supporting businesses in the region, providing them with programs, mentorship, um, access to funding, working with students, researchers, and that kind of stuff, and also co-working space. So we run a lot of events like this, so I'm very excited to be hosting, um, is it the first Growth Hackers Australia meetup in Western Sydney? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so if you want to learn more about um, Launchpad, you can go to launchpadlive.com.au or speak to myself after the event and any of the startups here. Put your hands up if you're a startup part of Launchpad. Yeah, so just talk to one of the startups. All right, that's it from me. I'm going to hand it over to you. Mysterious black Cool, so uh, I just wanted to introduce tonight's speakers. Um, um, quickly, so all the attention they get. Uh, I'll introduce them first, and then what I'll do is um, I'll get Nick up to speak about uh, you know his software, how he approaches marketing, and then I'll introduce Michelle as well at the same time. But I'll do another reading for when it's her turn to speak. Um, so to jump into it, Nick, give us a wave, Nick. <laughs> Put him on the spot. Uh, Nick's a great man of mine, um, a serial entrepreneur, several businesses, came from the investment banking world. Uh, he's the founder of a software program that we're really getting heavily into called Leaderhooks. Uh, so for us, what we're seeing in the market is that personalization in marketing is becoming so, it's almost becoming essential. And Leaderhooks is just this amazing program. I, I'm going to rate one on about it, so I'm going <laughs> to let Nick show you what it actually does. But um, we've got a lot of our clients and ourselves using the software, and it's just performed amazingly. So um, I'll bring Nick up to talk about that. Um, and I think you're doing millions of leads every single month across the platform. Right? We're doing quite a few, yeah. <laughs> quite a few. <laughs> Um, so he's going to take you through you know, some of the campaigns that are running up on there, the results, and um, I think you'll be as amazed as I'll be. So as Nick starts walking up, uh, we've got Michelle as well, she's kind of in the crowd. Michelle's in this little company, I don't know if you guys have heard of it, it's called Canva. Um, so Michelle, for me, like when I read um, what you do at Canva, I was like, man, she's like the marketer's marketer, like essentially looking at data and using data to, to improve marketing. And for me, that's kind of like a big quintessential marketer. Um, so I'll do a bit more of an intro when Michelle comes back up, but um, let's get Nick to the stage and get All right. started. <laughs> Thank you. All right, how to create campaigns using decision trees uh, and uh, scale to uh, 250,000 uh, leads per month, that's for one campaign. Right, so my favorite quote in marketing, or what sums up marketing the best, which is the aim of marketing is to know and, un and understand the customer so well 
uh, the product or service fits him and sells itself. So the purpose of Leads Hook, or what I do, essentially is to try and get as close as possible to this sentiment. So how do we do that? Right. I came across, uh, who here has heard of uh, Gary Halbert? Sir Gary of Halbert. All right. Uh, old school direct response. Uh, he came up with a coat of arms letter. It was a one-page letter. Uh, it was mailed about 600 million times. Made a lot of money. And they mailed it for well, almost 20 years. And uh, that was a, the first time when I met him, where we shared uh, the letter and how they came up with it. I was amazed that it was the both the best personalization that I've ever, ever, ever come across because it relied on the person's name because it was about uh, your coat of arms which necessarily requires your name and it, it occurred to me that what if you could uh, do that for every every type of marketing you ever did uh, he was lucky that he could use a telephone book um, in our case you know most of us can't get away with just a telephone book but he did and that was the genius of that personalization Right, so just to kind of share, uh, when you start doing personalization, um, you get really high opt-ins, and you also get tons of leads. Um, it goes, sometimes it goes viral as well, and you can start getting, uh, that's about 15,000 leads in an hour, actually. Um, so, <clears throat> all right, so what is not lead gen? Uh, normally, uh, I think we've kind of been a bit spoiled by the guru types who tell us that all you need is a name and email. Uh, <laughs> that's just a contact detail, it's not a, it's not a lead per se, because we currently don't know enough about them. So if, if you download a free plan, um, all I know about you is that you wanted a free plan. It does not tell me how close you are to buying something. Uh, what if uh, you were just doing research uh, about plans? So it's, it's not enough, and uh, we need to know uh, more. So what ends up happening is that you end up, uh, at least in most of the consulting work that I do, People kind of go in for the sale a little bit too early, a little bit too soon. We don't know enough about them. So we want to kind of move them down the path. If you're in the B2B sales space, uh, you'll kind of move towards the MQL and SQL, which is a marketing qualified lead and sales qualified lead. If you're doing a, a kind of consumer products, the, the distinction is not so important. But nevertheless, uh, the more you know about them, the better you can position what you're selling. Right, so we need more info. And uh, how do we do that? Well, you make an offer that is so compelling that your prospects beg you to take the details. So how do you do that? By giving a journey of self-discovery and diagnosis. That's been the basic framework that I've seen has worked in B2B, B2C, across numerous verticals, which essentially is, um, how, can I, uh, how can I show you or how can I uh, teach you to learn a little bit more about who you are and what you're looking for? And uh, that's where the idea of providing a personalized interactive experience comes from. Because it uh, allows you to basically uh, go down a journey where you make choices and the decision tree automatically changes and, and the final result being you get a personalized lead magnet. So normally what you do is you like, hey, put your name in email and get a PDF. Well, I'm just moved the kind of like the monkey onto your back now. Like it's your responsibility now to work out out of the 50 pages that I've got in my PDF, which page is relevant to you. Uh, so by providing a personalized lead magnet, what you're doing is you're cutting out the stuff that does not matter and you're only giving them what matters. And that's the reason why they want to give you their data. Because the giving, if, you give me, if, you, if you don't give me the right data, then the lead magnet itself is worthless. So I'm incentivizing you to give me the right data so you can get the, the right output. It's a kind of, you're aligning yourself to, uh, with, your, with, your, with your lead. So this is the one that I did for DMA for the last conference, uh, which was uh, uncover your personalized digital marketing profile in under 60 seconds, where if you went through this decision tree, in this case, uh, we dynamically generated a chart, uh, and it showed you your capabilities across, in this case, uh, six different uh, six different uh, kind of, uh, characteristics or factors of, uh, of digital marketing. The, the interesting thing was that we then push the data through to the email marketing system and then you can run a personalized email marketing sequence that if your weakness was uh, lead gen, then we'd talk to you only about lead gen. But the other thing we did is we aligned the speakers on the last page under the chart 
uh, of who you could help you with lead gen. So we said that if your school was low in lead gen, then these are the lead gen experts you may wanna, uh, whose sessions you may wanna attend at the seminar or the conference. So it turned the selling of a live event from just, hey, come do networking into a solution to a self-identified problem. And uh, uh, we didn't get to do too much marketing because it sold out. <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's my profile from just a random, um, according to this, I shouldn't be up here. <laughs> right, so basically this was the, the personalization that was offered, um, that if I suck, then I just need to go watch Greta and Fred. Uh, and uh, it was basically a list of people and then we just had a, a link to go buy the ticket. All right, so Stephen, who ran the event, basically, uh, you know, raved about how good it was. Uh, then this is a from a here example, just to show you that you can, it doesn't have to be uh, just a B2B, it can be B2C. So how happy is your hair? Um, a chatbot style, uh, same thing. We find a little bit about, about who you are, what your problems are, um, what your age is. Oops, sorry, I think uh, we have some problems there. Uh, and a little bit about uh, your age. And then it gave a personalized report here. So if I pick curly hair, it tell me just about curly hair, and then it matched the product, or it framed the product according to the profile I had given the system. Okay, so just keep going. There's a recommendation for the product. I uh, did a book launch with it for Michael Gerber. Same thing, we presented a chart. This thing went viral. We got about 3,000 leads at about six cents a lead or something. And he got a bestseller when we went live on the day the book launched. Uh, fitness, uh, job search, buy and rent a home, the prepper market, uh, which is a big market actually, I didn't know how big it was until I helped uh, create one of these things. Uh, we've got uh, beauty age, same thing. So just kind of run through a couple of examples. All right, so how do, how do you make these personal experiences? Uh, it basically, it's a, you create a decision tree, much like if you've used, uh, you know, ManyChat or any one of the other sort of workflow type diagrams, uh, you'd, you'd be kind of familiar with, with what it does. The, the, the difference is that we're taking that, what we're learning about you, uh, to construct a dynamic generated personalized lead magnet. That's the, that's the innovation here. <clears throat> and so this is the, the uh, digital marketing one. Uh, and you can see that uh, we use a whole bunch of conditional logic to construct the final page. Uh, and so based on the answers, th they were the nodes that would uh, calculate what content to put where and how to place that on the, onto the final page. Uh, and that's, they were basically the rules you set up that if you, like for example, if my analytics score was less than 51, then I'd hear about uh, Greta. Right, so we kind of done through a few diagrams as to um, how that works. Um, the most powerful question, so one of the things uh, I learned when I did my first one, which is a hair one, and that came about because I bought a company out for a, for a dollar and I didn't know how to sell the product. So I connected with a a uh, person who was a trichologist, and she used to work for Procter & Gamble. And I said, okay, if you were to sell this thing, how would you sell it? She goes, oh, I'd ask you this, this blah, 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 questions. I'm like, that's a lot of questions. How do you do that? So I tried to hack it with a quiz software, but it wouldn't work because they were too linear. So then I got the first version made, uh, and that's basically where I learned that the a question where you're asking people to select more than one answer, so you can tick all that apply, uh, it actually starts creating combinations of answers. So it's two to the power of number of choices you give. So for example, if you have a question like, I need help with, and you had five choices, that's two to the power of five, which is 32. So all of a sudden you're, but if you have enough of those, so in this case, because of the hair one, I had four answers for the first question, five choices, five choices, which creates 32. The last one is age, which is six. It gives you 24,000 unique lead magnets, but that's also 24,000 unique market segments. So if you then track your revenue data and you match it up against your market segment, you'd actually f work out who your real idle customer is, but it's based on data. All right, so then you can kind of, so then as I opened up the platform to other users, they started creating crazy stuff like this. Uh, <laughs> these days I see examples which make my head hurt, especially when they give us a support call, hey, how do I fix this? I have no idea. Like, there you go. It's like, <laughs> it's, this one here, it's one decision tree, it goes to 37 different offers. Uh, but the offers are so personalized to, to the path you took uh, that the conversions are really, really high. 
So that's, that's what it is. All, all, so all I'm doing is I'm doing consolidated selling at scale, right? Okay, my new best friend, which is, uh, for those of you who are a little bit on the techie side, uh, JavaScript events, which we can fire. So we, what we're doing now is we're taking the answers that we're giving on every node, we're firing that back into Google, Facebook, Pinterest, wherever you want to fire it to. And now we've got the ability to build custom audiences inside these third-party platforms, but based on the answers that someone gave us. So I can now uh, give you a decision tree without asking you for an email, because the audiencing in these platforms is a new email list, which means my conversion rates on these goes up to how about 100%, because there's no friction. I'm not asking for any personal details, yeah. but, well, but I still have the ability to, to work out who the hell you are and how to get back at you. I know it all. <laughs> Sauron. <laughs> right. The world's most valuable resource is no longer oil, but data. That's all it is. You're creating your own little Facebook. You, 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 you're creating your own first-party data. And that's the, the best thing about it, is that it's your data. So they can ban Facebook all they want, um, or whatever, you know, any of these other things that can happen, but you've still got a uh, ton more data. And that's a massive competitive edge to the rest of your competitors, who probably won't. Right, so how do you make this? So I'm just going to create a very simple example. Uh, the fastest way when no normally comes to me like, okay, cool, this is great. How do I execute this? I say, well, do you have an existing lead magnet, like a PDF or whatever? I'm like, well, let's work back from there. So we take the existing lead magnet, you rip it up in uh, what Gary Halbert used to call an, inven an inventory of interesting facts, which is basically just the nuggets uh, inside the lead magnet. You turn those nuggets into answers. So for example, uh, you know, uh, lead generation uh, is about learning about your customers. So the nugget would be learning about your customers. That would be one of the answers. And I create other fake answers, which is the step four. And then finally, just put it together in a sequence. And that's your decision tree done. This is kind of like the one-on-one -on -one version. Right. Donald Trump. So uh, normally, when I present this, it'd be like, well, I do surveys and all this sort of stuff. I'm like, well, that's the value of surveys. <laughs> and the Morrison win might tell you the same thing. All right, so the one thing that I'm not, or that is getting us good results is what I call emotionalizing your decision tree, which is in between you throw a question about what does this thing that you're trying to do, what does it mean to you? So for weight loss, would be losing 20 kilos would mean, you know, better life, I don't know, start procreating again, whatever. Uh, <laughs> what kind of... <laughs> Uh, in fact, that's what came up in one of the research we did, <laughs> that one of the reasons for losing weight is that. Um, what, are you, what are you going to do with the extra 400 bucks of income you're getting from your, from your investment property? And so it would like, you know, play more golf, take an extra day off, uh, you know, take my wife out for lunch, uh, sleep more. Um, and, but those answers that you provide um, themselves teaches you about who this person is and what they're looking for, which means now when you come up with your autoresponder copy or your landing page copy, you can match that to what you're learning about them. Right, almost there. So Gene Schwartz um, created, wrote a book called Breakthrough Advertising in 1967, uh, probably one of the best books in marketing ever written. And he came up with this construct of uh, you know, state of product awareness and uh, the state of market sophistication. So what I normally do is when I work the, for the consulting work that I do is I try and get a, a map of, this is the, because you can kind of go crazy with the data and with all this research stuff. So. If it's a small enough project, I actually just throw all that out and just start with a framework like this and say, well, where is the market sitting and who would be sitting in what quadrant? And to, just to give you a simple example uh, is, so this one here uh, is, I'm just trying to map the, if you look at the product awareness, uh, so I just made this, this uh, today before I gave the slides to, to Will, which is, we've got a recent issue with um, the apartments cracking. And so if I were to attack that market, and uh, therefore I would see that people are sitting everywhere from unaware to, to fully aware, what does that look like? So I would run five campaigns. The first one would be for the unaware market, seven known risks, seven little known risks when buying a high rise apartment. So anyone resonates with that tells me that they're kind of like in that space. Uh, if they recognize a the need, maybe they've read the news that you know, things cracking. Uh, a secret trick to sell your cracks in my building risk. So a way to mitigate the risk. Uh, but if you go further down the funnel, uh, you go you know, to someone who wants satisfaction, is 
how to preserve your capital gains even if your apartment collapses. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And then next comes the product awareness, which is the uh, five clauses you must add to your, your building insurance agreement that ensures a complete refund, including capital gains from, from the day that you purchase the property. And then the last one, which is the unbought, which is uh, uh, another word of way of uh, he called offer, which is the five minute came process, zero access, includes anklet, anti crack clauses, and it's backed by Lloyds of Government and 25% <coughs> off today. All right, so that would be so. Based on the campaigns that I would run, would immediately tell me if you resonate with it, which appeal, it tells me where you sit in the, in the market, which means now I know how to graduate you to the next step. Now, in order to execute that, um, you need a certain amount of skills. I wanted to kind of cover that. Uh, I work with a lot of guys in the US, they do you know, a couple hundred thousand leads a month, and they, the team that you work with there almost always has got uh, a, a well-rounded skill set. An individual, an individual is, is not going to have all of these skill sets, but generally speaking, the team you're working with does. And, and that's the reason why they're able to execute these things really, really fast. So when, whenever I present this sort of thing, like, hey, uh, you know, how can I execute this? It, it's, I'm not going to say that it can't be done by one person, but it's sort of difficult to have someone who's, who's great at persuasion, marketing, analytics, and traffic, and gets the technical aspects. You know, you're going to have to have a bit of a team environment. So anyway, so let's just kind of share with you that it's, it's all doable, it's not too difficult, but uh, uh, you need to be sort of well-rounded in your capability. And if you do all that, you'll be jumping like this person. <laughs> Thank you. Cool, you want to see graphic Q&A? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, how do you, do you guys want to do Q&A first? Yeah. Yeah, let's do that first because it's fresh in our minds, so we'll do Q&A first. Okay. And then we'll sorry, 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 sorry. Um, so I think it'd be interesting, instead of doing a Q&A, um, I think the way that I learnt this program the most was kind of applying it, putting it into practice. Um, yeah. So when I saw the slides, the first time I saw it, uh, back a few months ago, I was just like, okay, cool, great program, now what? Um, so I think it makes you really, you kind of, the lessons and you know, the principles behind the marketing you do really gets, um, gets set once you actually go through a live example. So any of you guys want to volunteer a business and we can get Nick to talk you through how he'd approach um, the tree in your case. Okay, so I'm wanting to enter into the complementary medicines uh, marketplace, but focusing on arthritis uh, relief cream. Okay. Um, all right, so the first thing uh, I would do is um, The author is escaping me. There's a book, uh, and he covers 18 different appeals that are universal across everybody. And so what I would normally do, and this is my hack, is I look at the product and I go, okay, which one of these applies? So in your case, it would be fear of aging, uh, if it's arthritis, or fear of, of pain, or the, yeah, those sort of angles. Um, could, but you could also push it to things like, uh, like uh, live a more fulfilled life, um, you know, so, so, so those sort of angles. Correct, yeah. Th then what I'd do is I'd uh, basically come up with the, this thing here. I'd use that to see, of everybody in the market for arthritis, how many are unaware that they're, uh, I'm guessing not too many, uh, but... Actually, it's hidden. Arthritis is about 800 different types of arthritis. Okay. Okay, so I'm not talking about technical level, but, but more like, it, it, like yeah, if, I'm, if it's yeah, hurting. Yeah, yeah so, the, the, so the, yeah. there would be distribution uh, here, some sort of property distribution, and uh, all the way to product awareness. So in your case, they wouldn't know product awareness because they don't know your product per se, but they'd know the solution. So I would basically start working on ideas um, based on the appeals and then matching it across something like this and then come up with, with concepts to test, start testing with and immediately drive traffic. Now, I know this is going to be like, wow, I can't believe I'm driving traffic already. Yeah, it's because you want to start, quickly start validating, you know, is before wasting money in, you know, R&D and whatever else you're going to do. I, I even do dry testing, which is essentially provide a cart when there's no even product to sell. And you refund right away. So I've, I've tested that as well. Where, so that way, because hypothetically, I can tell you, I can, let's say there's an arthritic, hey, if you had this, and like, yeah, sure, I'll buy it. How much? A hundred bucks. Okay, cool. Well, here you go, and now I've got to think about it. 
that's exactly what happens. Because yes. uh, did a lot of consumer research where, where you'd find that. So how do you how do you move past that? Well, he's you, you you drive the traffic to a page, they go through a shopping cart experience or the landing page copy, and you create an entire campaign and you get them to buy the damn thing. And if they don't buy, there's no market. So but at least you're spending your time in testing. And using a framework like this, and a decision tree will start telling you uh, where they sit in the buying continuum and where, who's resonating with what. So now you have a very good profile, especially when you start getting the revenue data, of this is what my ideal customer looks like. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Is that helpful? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much. Cool, no problem. So if uh, you don't have the product still we can offer on a refund basis, that is what you recommend? So the I, I don't recommend anything. <laughs> <laughs> I just tell you what I do. <laughs> yeah, so we are actually developing an asthma alert uh, app. Yep. So the product is not ready, but we want to know how to market. Uh, That's it. Customers. Sell it. And, uh, how to get, uh, Sell it before you build it. Yeah. How to get the pre-sale? That is what. Uh, yeah. Don't want the pre-sale. Just just get them to go through a. a yeah. But the yeah. app is not ready. So that doesn't matter. Yeah. Make, make them free. Yeah. 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 Don't, don't take the money. Get the very last step before you take the money. Yeah, because it's uh, complex. It is yeah. not as uh, like any other. Yeah, well, I, I suppose I guess what I could say is, is come up with some variation thereof. Okay, I mean, maybe the, the example does not translate one to one in this case. But nevertheless, you want to start validating an idea. I, I spoke to a cardiologist a couple of months ago. They've spent like a couple of million bucks of developing something. I'm like, how do you know there's a market? He goes, oh, but I look at people in my surgery. I'm like, that's not a market. That's just people in your surgery. The government's paying for them. Of course they're there. <laughs> That's not real. So there's a lot of illusion out there about, about you know, who's going to spend what. So get to the credit card as fast as possible to validate the idea. Does that help? Yes. Yeah, many people are not willing to give the credit card. Yeah, that's the problem. So the <laughs> That's exactly what I'm telling you to test. <laughs> startup podcast on YC, make sure you've got a product that people want and we'll talk all their friends about it as well. So yeah. if your friends aren't buying a product, maybe it's a shit product yeah. and you've got to find out faster. Yeah, or, or, or the positioning is not right. That's, yeah. that's what it is. I've often found that it's not, because you can take any product, the product is actually irrelevant actually. It's, it's, it's what is the story around it that's going to sell you the product. That's, it's a vantage point through which you show the people your product. That's, 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 that's the whole game. And if I can change the positioning, I can change your perception of what, this, what are you buying. And so that's all, you, that's all you're working with. You're in the business of, I don't know, creating emotions. So, Nika, I get the process with the arthritis cream, you got a miracle cure. Yeah. But how do you draw people initially to actually engage with them, to actually start the process? Just, just we, um, let's come back to that. That's a good question. Yeah. Okay. We'll come back to the bigger Q&A session afterwards. A bigger Q&A. Yeah, okay. Or if, the small Q&A. Yeah, that's right. right yeah, so we'll, do, we'll do a combined Q&A. I'm trying to get both of these guys up here because Two point I think the stuff that Michelle's going to cover as well, right? yeah, the stuff that Michelle's going to cover as well sure. will be really good around that and it's going to be looking at you know, the data and stuff as well. So I think part of that might answer it, but if not, we'll get, we'll get yeah. both of these guys up. Uh, cool. So how was that, guys? Thanks, Nick. Okay, cool. Um, and as Michelle starts working on I get there to help us out with um, this slides. Sorry. I'll take this off. I don't think this might work. Oh, it's, um, that's fine. It's for recording. That's what they're recording. Oh, it's for recording. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, it's actually pretty funny because the slides that you see here are actually done on Canva. So, when I was putting the slides together, we were all Nick's slides, and Michelle's at the slides. I'm like, good work. Like, that's <laughs> like repping the product. Um, cool. So, guys, I'm, I mean, I don't think I need to introduce Canva. You guys all know who it is. Um, so you guys have done an awesome job in terms of the emails. I get the emails, so awesome work. Um, rather than me talking up here, I'll hand it up to you and you can take us through your awesome slide. Sounds good. So yes, these slides have been made in Canva. Um, they show how awesome Canva is. So maybe create your next presentation in, in Canva. Um, so I work in the email marketing team um, and today I'll be running through uh, a key part of how we do email and CRM marketing. Um, what we always look to do uh, in our team is to drive impact and then try and 10x the impact that we drive. Um, and the way that we do that is we implement a measurement framework. The measurement framework allows us to put tangible numbers against core company KPIs. 
So like most companies out there, our core company KPIs are aligned with cash and revenue and engagement, which we measure with active users. Um, and what we're able to do is put these tangible numbers to it. Those aren't real numbers, um, they're just there for sure. Um, and we can also start building in charts and dashboards like this where we can track the impact that we're having over time against these core company KPIs. And this becomes extremely helpful when we're reporting to uh, key stakeholders in the business, um, trying to show the team how we're performing as a team, all the, all the work that we're putting in day to day, how does that translate to actual cash numbers and active user numbers. Um, and this is really awesome because then we can feel really proud about the cash that we're generating in and the love that we're bringing to the product. Um, and it feels extremely empowering in many ways. So one of the ways that this measurement framework really empowers us is that um, a lot of times you're, there's a lot of teams in the company um, who want and need resources to grow their side of the business. Um, and when you're able to put numbers against the impact that you're driving, it makes it far easier to put together a case to request for resources. Whether that's getting a back-end engineer into your team or a machine learning expert, you have a voice and you have a way to justify your need. The second thing that really uh, the framework really empowers us to do is prioritization. So we're actually quite a small team at Canva, considering the amount of uses that we have. Um, and a lot of the times we get requests about many different things, sending an email about a product update, a product release, um, potentially surveys, and I'm sure you guys have felt all these marketing requests come in as, as someone who is a marketer. And a lot of the times you end up leaving work with a longer to-do list than the day before. Um, and that's not very scalable. So one principle that we work really closely with is the Pareto principle. We focus um, most of our time, so 80% of our, we, fo we focus most of our time on the 20% of the of the work and the campaigns that drive 80% of the impact. Um, and the third thing that really helps with is decision making. So sometimes you're working on campaigns like the newsletter um, that goes out weekly. It requires a lot of investment of your resources. You spend a lot of time trying to curate the content, to write the content, A/B test the subject lines. Is it actually worth all the time that you're investing in it? Um, and when you're able to measure, is this campaign actually driving impact for your business? It's a very simple and easy decision to say, yes, let's continue investing more resources into it, or let's look into a new idea. Um, and the third thing that really, oh, fourth thing it really helps with is reporting. So like those charts I showed earlier, it's extremely easy to communicate with key stakeholders, the impact that your team is driving. Um, and to show your team all the work that they're doing day to day, what kind of impact it's having, and also to set goals. So it really helps to set those goals and to see how you're tracking and progressing towards those goals. Um, and the fourth thing is driving impact. So a lot of the times we don't jump into something thinking it's a good idea and go all out on it. We launch MVP experiments. Uh, to test it out and scope it out. Is there room, is it driving um, any impact? And if it is, then we'll look at investing more resources and scoping it out a, more, a bit more. Um, and all of this measurement framework, it just really empowers and superpowers the team to drive the next level of impact. Um, and the way that we implement this measurement framework is with global experiment and global control groups. So imagine that big purple circle is anyone, like all the users in your user base, anyone you can potentially message. What we do is we take out a small segment of those users to be the global control group, and anyone who's not in the global control group is the global experiment group. Users, we don't, we literally don't send any marketing comms to users in our global control group. And the only people that receive marketing comes from us are the ones that are in the experiment group. And the only difference between these two groups is a single random variable. So they are completely identical, and whether a user ends up in the control group or the experiment group is completely random. And that's what we do to control the bias and to ensure that we're actually measuring our impact accurately. So to take this to a shopping cart abandonment example, something I think all familiar with, 
Um, so imagine your user base is made up of 1 million users. Uh, 900, 900k of them are in the experiment group and 100k of them are in the control group. And typically, 10% of your users abandon your cart. So that means 90k people in your experiment group have abandoned their cart, you send them an email, and they end up, and 7% of them end up repurchasing, or finishing their order, not repurchasing. Um, and in your control group, likewise, we see the same 10% who um, end up abandoning the cart. That's around 10k users, you don't send them any comms, um, and they end up converting at 4%. So the control group helps set that baseline of what would have happened if you weren't sending out any of your marketing comps. So once you have your once you have that baseline, what you can do is subtract the conversion rate of your experiment group against the conversion rate of your control group. That's a three percent uplift that your campaigns have driven. And when you multiply it by the number of users in your um, who have abandoned the cart in your experiment group, that means this campaign has driven an uplift of two thousand seven hundred orders and you know what the average order cost is, and you multiply that, and you know how much revenue you've brought to the company with this campaign. So why use these global experiment and control groups? Um, there are a few main reasons. One is accuracy in attribution. So sometimes you might send an email, someone clicks, going back to the abandoned cart example, you send the abandoned cart email, someone clicks through on it to complete their order. Does that mean that if you, don't, if you didn't send that email, they wouldn't have converted? they might still have converted and you don't know. And that's what the control helps you do. It helps set the baseline and you know what would have happened if you didn't send your comps out. The second thing is um, it avoids, you avoid biases when you use global experiment and control groups. So I think a question that I get asked is, can we compare users who have received emails to users who have not received emails and use that to measure impact? Short answer is no. Um, the, users, it, the users who do receive emails and you're able to send comms to, they are naturally a far more engaged audience. They have opted into your emails, they have not uninstalled your app, they have not been sunsetted from your email list, and all these other filters that you have. Um, and by nature, they will convert far better than users in your control group. So even if your campaign was having no impact at all, if, you were, if you're comparing users who have received to users who have not received, your, compa your campaign would always appear successful. Um, and the third thing is having a holistic understanding of the impact that you're having. So one example is our newsletter. So our newsletter, we don't have a huge, like an extremely high click-through rate on our newsletter. And we send our newsletter out each week. But does that mean our newsletter doesn't have a very big impact? Not quite, because um, we need to be able to measure the branding impact of that newsletter. Sometimes having something appear in your inbox, even though if you don't, even if you don't open it, or even if you don't click it, you're more likely to visit that store in real life or go to that website online next time when you have a need. So Canva isn't a week, like for most people, it's not a weekly design need. You go to it when you have to write a Mother's Day card or a birthday card. Um, and having those emails come into your inbox means that next time you have a need, you think, oh, I, I can go to Canva. Um, it also helps us with, oh, it also helps us with um, just day-to-day -day campaign decision making. So we are able to identify what the conversion rate of our experiment group is for, um, for a particular campaign versus the control group. And one example that we did this on is um, Canva provides a paid subscription. Um, and what happened was we sent out an email to users who are paying for the product, but they weren't actually using the product. And the goal was to get them more engaged with the product they were paying for. What we saw was, we actually saw churn rates for our subscription go up for our experiment group. Because those users were like, ah, oh, we're still paying for this, let me cancel. Um, so that was something to be mindful of. Another example that we came across like two weeks ago was, um, we saw that we, we were sending out a campaign and users who were receiving the campaign were actually less active than users who didn't receive the campaign. And it was really baffling to kind of understand why, how could a campaign actually reduce engagement with the app or with the website? Um, and the short answer, like when we dug into the data, what we found out was that campaign was actually blocking the send of a more important campaign. So users in the control group, those that this was a campaign specific control group, they received the more important campaign and users in the experiment group were blocked from saving the important campaign and instead got this other one. 
So it's really helpful for looking at the and that. Um, another example that it, another decision it helps with is when you have a mul like multiple campaigns, and this comes with the Pareto principle. So we can see there we have four campaigns here. For campaign B and D, we might discover that we're putting and expending in a lot of time and effort into building those campaigns, but it's not really driving a lot of impact. Um, and potentially we can consider terminating or stopping those campaigns altogether. And if we see campaign A and C, the first and the third one, we see that it's driving significant impact. What we can start to look at is, can we scale this out to more users? Can we invest more time in these campaigns? Can we send these campaigns with inc increasing cadence um, and frequency? Um, so something to consider when you're using global experiment and control groups is that um, over time, you are able to email less and less users in your user base. So, and that might become that might be due to reasons like unsubscriptions, you're sunsetting your users so that your IP remains healthy, um, or you've been marked as spam. So there's a few like there's multiple reasons why your email list actually the proportion of people you can email in your user list decreases over time. So on the y-axis, we have percent of users that you can email um, in your experiment group. And on the x-axis, you have time. So you can see that it just keeps diminishing. Um, and what that means is when you're doing your analysis, you're adding in a lot of noise to it because in your experiment group, there are less and less people that you can email. And you're comparing those users to use in your control group. Um, and when we look at this chart, so the chart on the left, which is at some earlier time, T1, uh, you can email 90% of them. And then on the chart on the right, at some later time, T2, you can email 30% of them. So say for instance, your e you know your email campaign is driving um, a 5% uplift. So users who receive your email convert at 15%. At time T1, that would look like a 14.5% conversion rate because you can only impact the 90% of users that you can email. That other 10% are the 10% of users that are diluting your results. And at the later time, even assuming that your campaign still drives a 15% conversion rate, that will actually look like an 11.5% conversion rate because you can only impact the 30% of users that you're emailing. The rest of the 70% are users who are diluting your results. And that's just something good to keep in mind. Um, what we can do is we can overcome that by using things like time filters. So if we look at all users, say you can only email 30% of all the users in your base. That means when you do the com when you compare control and experiment groups, um, the impact that you're seeing is has been downloaded by 70% of users that you can't message. Um, but then what you also know is that um, users, for users like new users who have signed up less than six months ago, you can contact 90% of them. So when you add in a filter for users who have signed up less than six months ago, um, you know that your results will be, won't be as diluted. You know that you'll have a much clearer picture of the impact that your campaign is having. Um, because say you can email 90% of them, there will only be 10% dilution there. And you can see a much bigger increase. Um, and Something like this is good to keep in mind. We don't want to, having that data is, is extremely helpful because then it helps you understand what is the diminishing returns that you have on your older users. It's good to understand that the impact that you're having on older users as well as the impact that you're having on your newer users because that means it might be worth investigating into other channels of how you might be able to resurrect or get those users to update their email addresses. And that's pretty much it, how we do email marketing and CRM at Canva. Awesome, thanks Michelle. Um, obviously you've got you know, your really busy stuff at Canva. So I imagine you have a few things to do, so appreciate you coming along um, and showing us all this awesome stuff that you guys do at Canva. Um, I'll kick off for question and I'll take a couple from you guys. So I guess my question is, I'm sneaking one in here. Um, I've actually got two. So I'll wait to the end and ask another one. So the first one is, obviously you're um, doing all this email stuff. You talked about you know, potentially other platforms or other channels of resurrecting um, dead, shall we call it, mm. um, segments as well. What other kind of ways do you work, or what other teams do you work with within Canva 
to kind of get that going? Um, so we work a lot with our product team. So some of these users, all the users that you no longer can email, especially ones who've signed up with Facebook, they're using extremely old email addresses. What we might do is we might have like an in-product banner or an alert bar, notification alert at the top saying, oh, please update your email address to get the latest product tips, updates from us um, and exclusive information. So that's one of the ways that we do it. Um, some other ways that we can consider but we're not really doing at the moment is potentially retargeting through paid ads if that user, if the LTV of that user is worth that expense. Cool, awesome. Um, questions, guys? So just want to understand, uh, now especially with mobile apps and PWAs, you have uh, push notifications as well, right? So, so how much of uh, the marketing split, so how is it that, you know, uh, is it between push notifications versus email, is it a split that you manage or you just go all out across all the channels of marketing? Um, so we maintain global experiment and global control groups so that we can actually put a number to the impact that we're having as a team and that we have the same global experiment group for our like, users that we can contact with email and push and the same control group for users that we can contact with email and push the same ones. What we do do at times is, for example, for a specific push campaign that we're sending, we don't know what kind of impact it's having, so we'll have a campaign specific control group. And that way, that will allow us to measure the impact of that campaign alone, or that channel alone. Um, we use off-the-shelf products. Um, we are like we actually don't have any data analysts on our team. We do all this on our own. Um, the tool that we use at the moment is Amplitude. Um, it's been really helpful. Our email service provider has plugged in very conveniently into the analytics tool and allows us to kind of create these charts on the fly. Well, I'm going to sneak another question in. So you know how um, in the market people always say email is dead. What's your take on it um, and Canvas take? Like, are you guys doubling down? Are you guys, you know, is it just a channel you maintain? Like, what's your, what's your view on that? Um, I definitely don't think email is dead and we have numbers to prove it. Um, something that is a key priority for us and a channel that we've discovered to be really effective in actually getting users to um, subscribe to the trial um, and also increasing their engagement with the app. Cool, awesome. Um, any other ones before we, what we might do is, um, I think we can call it then, and we'll just hang around for another 10 minutes. If you guys have any more questions you want to um, ask either Michelle or Nick, uh, please feel free to go and grab them and have a quick chat. And um, thanks for coming along, guys. This is the first event in Para. Um, on the meetup group, give me all your feedback, what you guys liked about it. If we get enough interest, and tell all your friends, if we get enough interest, we can always run more events in Parramatta as well, uh, not just keeping them in the city. So let, let us know what you think. Um, feedback's always awesome. And yeah, hopefully to see you guys next time. Yeah.